I wanted to talk to you a lot about engines uh, and maybe <laughs> about Starship and maybe about your own becoming an actual astronaut, but like, let, let's just go there uh, before all that and, and, and talk about the actual culture of SpaceX and uh, your conversations with uh, Elon. You've toured SpaceX facilities with him. You've interviewed him, you've interacted with him. Uh, what have you learned about rockets, about propulsion, about engineering, about design, about life from those interactions? Um, he's pretty transparent, uh, open human being uh, as an engineer, as a, uh, as a leader, as a person. I would definitely say the biggest takeaway I've had from my times with Elon at SpaceX is really like the, the idea of questioning your constraints. He says that a lot, but he also does it a lot. <laughs> like he, though, you know, there'll be times where like you'll see him change on a dime because he's like rethinking of something in a, in a new or different way. And for me, you know, I, I, I think we all put constraints on ourselves. We, we think about our own limits, you know, on, on things that we can or cannot do. And I think, it's made me kind of question like, well, wh why am I, why did I say, no, I can't do that? Or, you know, uh, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, it, a good example. Uh, I, so in Iowa, I live in Iowa or half the time or whatever. And, uh, there's a, a bike ride across the state of Iowa called Ragbri. And every year you just, you know, like thousands of people get together and they, they ride across Iowa. And it was last summer, uh, I met up with some friends and like, Hey, do you want to go on Ragbri this year? I'm like, it's like a week away. They're like, yeah, you want to go? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so I did you know, without, and it was one of those moments where I was proud of myself because it's like, I, it's easy to just be like, no, you know, I'm not ready or this is my constraint is like, I'm not in shape, mm -hmm. but like just question that, you know? And, and so I think when it comes down to questioning your own constraints, it's yes, it's even to that level of like, why do you question yourself on what you can and cannot do? So that's for your personal life is really powerful, but a little bit more intuitive. I think what's really hard is to question constraints in a place like uh, aeronautics or yeah. uh, or robotics or uh, autonomous vehicles or vehicles, because there's people, there's experts everywhere that have done it for decades. Yeah. And everyone admires those experts and respects those experts. Yeah. And you, for you to step into a room uh, knowing not much more than just uh, what's in a Wikipedia article, yeah. And to right. be, just use your intuition and first principles thinking to disagree with the experts, that takes uh, that takes some uh, guts, I think. Well, and you can't have everyone doing that either. You know, like there has to be some humility of knowing that something is a hardened right. concept and a hardened. You know, like especially I, I'm not an engineer. I don't I don't do this stuff. You know, but I can imagine you sitting there having spent six years on a type of valve that perfectly manages crowding propellants or whatever, and someone walks in and says. Why don't you just put a heater element in there? You know, or something that's, you know, something like, because, you've tried, you know, we've done that 40 times or whatever, or whatever, you know, like, I'm sure there are things like that that are very frustrating, but, but see, the so thing I don't is, know what that's like, you know? The thing is with the experts, they're always going to be frustrated when the newbie comes in with their first principles thinking, but sometimes that frustration is justified and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just stubbornness for failing to acknowledge a better way. And I've seen it both directions, so which is really interesting. So you need you need both, but that tension is always going to be there, and there has to be a, a almost like a dictatorial uh, imperative that breaks through the the expertise of the way things have been been done in the past to push forward like a new way of doing it. And Elon's done that. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of great engineers uh, do that in the machining in machine learning world because there's been so much development, I've seen that happen. Usually when there's like rapid development that starts to come into play. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've seen that in autonomous vehicle space, um, brain computer interfaces that Elon has evolved with, all of it. It's kind of fascinating to watch. Um, what about the actual design and enge engineering of the engine? Since you've learned about so many different kinds of engines over the past few years, just like what stands out to you about the way that engineering is done at SpaceX or that Elon does engineering? The hardest thing to kind of remember is like how much stuff was developed in the 50s and 60s. You know, the, the concepts finally being utilized today were already literally done in the 60s. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the things that SpaceX is doing isn't a novel concept per se, you know, they're like, for instance, the Raptor engine utilizes the full flow stage combustion cycle engine. 
And that was already developed by the Soviets in the 60s um, for an engine called the RD-270. And it makes sense. Uh, like on paper, 100%, it makes sense because you're basically extracting the absolute maximum potential of the chemical energy in both propellants. And, you know, at the at the end of the day, like you have to be dumb enough to say, we're going to try using this thing because it's actually really complicated to to do what they're doing. But at the same time, like so are, so are rockets, like rocket engines are already stupid complicated. So adding, you know, 10, 20% more, you know, pain in the butt during the R&D, if it's, you know, in the long, long, long 20, 30 year existence or whatever, you know, like future of that engine, is that going to be worth it? Obviously, SpaceX said, yeah, I think we can actually develop this, this Raptor engine. So it's it's just interesting to see the things that have been looked at, or even reusability, you know, like the space shuttle was reusable. It was fully, uh, the upper stage, you know, the, the shuttle itself, the, the orbiter was, you know, I mean, that thing was, for all intents and purposes, a reusable rocket. Now, did it live up to its expectations? Not necessarily. So it put, left a lot of bad taste in people's mouth on the, the ideas of reusability. So for SpaceX to kind of come back into the room and on the table and say, we're going to use a reusable rocket. Specifically, we're going to do a fully reusable rocket. You know, a lot of people are, st even still today, a lot of people are going, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> even today. Even today. So like oh, yeah. long term, you're not going to be able to reuse at scale. Yeah. But <sighs> yeah. definitely, I think the number of people that are saying that today is is a small portion of those that were saying that type of thing five years ago. You know, when Elon did that announcement in 2016, um, for the ITS, it was very, very aspirational. And people were just like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a large number of people that had the factual reasons to, to think that and do that. You know, um, at the time they'd only landed like two rockets or something, you know, at, when they did that, or maybe three, it was a very small number. Uh, when they announced that actually they had just lost <laughs> a couple months prior, they just lost, uh, Amo six. So they like, they were still this young blossoming company and to come in and be like, we figured out reusability and now we're going to go full scale and make the world's biggest, most heaviest, most powerful rocket ever. And we're going to fully reuse it. And it's going to go to Mars. It was just pretty out there. Like it really was. And, well, yeah, you know, it's yeah. all about perspective. But now yeah. again, we're coming up on 100 consecutive landings of an orbital class rocket that's, you know, 45 meters tall, 3.7 meters wide. Like this thing is huge, weighs 20 metric tons, even empty when it's landing, that thing's already huge. So seeing the success of that, I think people are now more like, well, okay, maybe maybe there is actually the opportunity to be fully reusable. That's definitely probably the biggest constraint that I think has been questioned. That is the reusability. Being, yep. And then of course, like the broader one of cost, of bringing down costs, uh, that it's able to, you're able to kind of bring down costs so much that this, something like colonizing Mars or many trips to Mars will be a possibility. That's yeah, people don't even. That seems so far out that they, they don't even have time or give effort to questioning it. Yeah, but it's the implied questioning. Can you really do that Can many launches? Actually, do it. Can and you actually do it? Yeah, it's it's looking. I think it's one of those things where you look at the curve. You know, you look at like ten years ago, that was ridiculous. Yeah, following this curve, if SpaceX goes from you know two years ago launching, I don't remember what it was, forty times to sixty times to a hundred times this year, is there is their amount. And if we just keep extrapolating that out, if they, maybe not that exponential, maybe it goes more linear or whatever, what's 20, 30 years, like the amount of stuff we can put on orbit and and the potential we have to do things, like absolutely. Now, I don't want to put a time frame, like, you know, yeah, I think, but you got to think it's, it, we're increasing the number of launches. We're increasing the amount of things in space. We're increasing the amount of payload on orbit. That's probably not going to decrease anytime soon. And therefore eventually like the idea of going to Mars is absolutely reasonable.